Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I am Seren. I am uh, I am the CEO of Dilum. Uh, so uh, one of the reasons behind this webinar <laughs> today. Um, and uh, where, what Dilum does uh, for those who are not uh, acquainted with us is the um, software for angel group managers. So basically what we do is provide tools uh, for managing the deal flow, the funnel uh, and uh, and member community. Um, and we are this April celebrating our fifth anniversary. Uh, happy birthday to us. Uh, and we decided to celebrate it uh, with, with some useful and, and good uh, webinars um, and uh, spoke with, with Equitam. Uh, uh, who was very kindly uh, happy to join, jump in on the board and uh, share the knowledge uh, that they have collected over the years about how to calculate evaluation for startups, something that often comes up uh, during discussions and is, uh, is very much uh, a topic that probably deserves more uh, attention than it does at the moment. Um, so I'll just hand over to Daniel. Uh, please, yeah, uh, the stage is yours. Uh, and uh, just for the uh, housekeeping perspective, we also have Q and A box open. So if there are any questions uh, that you want to uh, want to get answers to or have any thoughts, then please do share in the Q and A box. Uh, you can also vote for uh, for the best questions. Uh, so in the end, we have fifteen minutes, especially dedicated to to answer anything that uh, that you have asked. And of course, uh, the questions that get more votes uh, will be uh, uh, answered first. Uh, so please do use that opportunity. All right, over to you, Daniel. Thanks, Seren. And uh, yeah, <laughs> what every kid wants for their uh, birthday, right? Start of valuation webinar. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, no, thank you for thank you for having us, and uh, we're super uh, super happy to do this with uh, with you, and and hopefully, uh, yeah, everybody finds some value today. Um, we have about an hour. Uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna be speaking for about 45 minutes, and then, as Seren said, uh, we'll have a Q and A at the end. So, uh, yeah, feel free to drop your questions on the chat. Um, but yeah, let's get it. Uh, let's get it started. So, uh, I'm Daniel Falapa. I'm founder and, and CEO of uh, of Equidam. Um, originally from Italy, um, have a background in uh, from uh, in finance and investment from the Rotterdam School of Management. But mostly, I've been doing more than eight years now in startup valuation um, with Equidam. We did all sorts of funding rounds from 20k friends and family to uh, two billion um, fundraising on uh, on the Nasdaq. Uh, so. You know, seen a bit of uh, of everything and in all kinds of industries, and um, uh, let me see. Yeah, and a little bit about Equidam. Uh, we are uh, a startup valuation platform, so for uh, for startups, but also for all uh, users, including you know, crowdfunding platforms, angel groups, and stuff like that. Uh, we started in 2013. We valued more than 130,000 startups uh, to date. And uh, yeah, we're partnering with some great companies like Dilum uh, around the world to uh, spread valuation knowledge and uh, you know try to help make sure that valuation is not a deal breaker between uh, angels and investors when there are when there are funding rounds, right? So, but that's kind of it for for a plug for today. Um, we wanna. Uh, talk a second about uh, the outline today. So we're going to talk about uh, pricing as a comparative process, uh, components of pricing uh, and, and uh, fair market value, valuation methods. Uh, is valuation worth doing at all at early stage and for early stage startups? Um, spoiler, we think it is, but uh, we'll see. And uh, the problem of averages, which I think is a very interesting thing to consider when doing valuation. The Obviously, we're probably going to have all sorts of uh, uh, knowledge in the audience today. So um, maybe some things are going to be uh, slightly basic, but I think they are a good refresher. We're going to mostly talk about uh, valuation principles, not uh, nothing super uh, deep, let's say. But, uh, but still, I think a good, uh, interesting reflection points. Um, and the first thing, right, when we think about pricing, um, to, to set the foundation around valuation is that uh, pricing is always competitive, right? So pricing for, for anything is always based on comparisons, right? With other products in other markets, in you know similar products, less similar products, and, and so on, right? So 
the fewer comparisons we have, the higher the uncertainty in price, right? And this is gonna be a recurring theme. So if we think about the classic example of the Coke bottle in the desert, right? No comparison, um, like probably somebody's gonna is gonna give you everything they have for that uh, for that Coke bottle, especially if it's cold <laughs> in the desert, right? So, uh, but if we think about art, obviously, and nowadays uh, NFTs and uh, and all that, no comparisons. The, every picture is unique, right? Every every uh, you can compare kind of you know maybe the time that it took to make or or the size of the canvas, things like that. But it kind of stops there. So super super difficult to uh, to get the price, to get the value on art, right? And uh, the same goes for startups, right? They're they're all different. They they have different widely different uh, future uh, perspectives and uh, and so how do we uh, how do we value them right um but you know luckily there is a bit more comparisons compared to um, compared to art and 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 uh, and cook cook bottle in the desert the bottom line right is that there are some components to price right the bottom line is that the price reflects what people are willing to pay right there should be enough value for the person to purchase at that price right um and what is this value for the person because in the end it's a personal decision right despite you know then then i think we join together as people in companies uh, but it remains a joint person people decision right so um generally speaking right people are gonna find value with things that um, generate utility for them utilitarian view of the world let's say but uh, not only return on capital so when we talk about startups right return on capital for sure like that's what we look out for that's what we um, we look at mostly but there is personal brand when when investing in the startup personal return you know whether there are board seat prestige these type of things uh, there could be environmental concerns we're seeing a lot of uh, especially institutional investors uh, being very concerned with with uh, the environment in their in their investments image concerns again mixed with with all the previous ones pretty much um, future enjoyment you might you know like to work with a, with a founder more than another one you might be willing to pay more for the for the founder that uh, that you like so it's not all about returns it's not all about capital returns right Right. The, however, uh, that's what valuation focuses on, right? And and um, I'm not here to to tell you otherwise because it's already hard enough, I believe, and uh, and it's already uncertain enough that everything else kind of um, is even more advanced. And at the moment, there aren't the uh, research or resources or methods to take into account everything else. So. Um, so we're going to focus on uh, return on capital, but with, a, I think, with a thought on the fact that this is not the whole thing. This is not the whole determinant of price, even though, you know, sometimes it looks like. Um, so when we talk about return on capital, right, we need to introduce the big assumption of fair market value, right? That's what we look at in terms of uh, uh, valuation generally right um so there are a lot of uh, <laughs> assumptions on this right and that's already like super important to understand i think in, if we want to get to the bottom of the valuation question right the um if you look at the definition of fair market value is the value of the asset as exchanged by a willing buyer and seller on uh, hypothetical fair market conditions, which doesn't mean anything, if you ask me, um, but that's that's what we have. And this is the definition that is used by regulators uh, to decide on taxation on a lot of fair market value assumptions, right? Um, when it comes to startups, I think my interpretation and, and Equidam's interpretation is um, we're trying to determine a price in uh, in in these conditions right in a condition when there is more than one informed and willing buyer but it doesn't get to hype right which is already like a strong condition uh there isn't any downward pressure for lack of buyers either right um there are no significant synergies in the purchase so that's another important aspect the valuation 
let's say the fair market value, the, the naked valuation of, of this company doesn't include synergies. So when companies are bought by other companies, synergies are substantial uh, and, and you know, they should be studied um, on top of the, value, on the valuation of the company as a standalone. Uh, <clears throat> we're also uh, assuming that parties have a balanced and agreed upon future outlook, right? Um, it's not an, an impossible to achieve type of extra exaggerated um, future um, from both sides. And uh, um, there is no significant knowledge that the buyer has, uh, uh, sorry, that the seller has about the buyer other than they are a trusted party, right? So they're not trying to, to play the negotiation game, at least when we calculate fair market value, right? Um, that's, kind of what we try to do, what we try to, to base our uh, valuations on. Why? Um, well, these are almost never true, as I'm sure like you, you figured. The uh, market value is always going to differ in the end from fair market value, but uh, it is the best starting point we have. We could do some math on, on synergies, right? Especially when the, the investment is from, a, from a, a corporate or somebody that actually has synergies. Generally, an angel investor has percentage-wise uh, small synergies with their investment and a VC as well. Um, they're mostly capital providers, but when it's a corporate investment, synergies are significant. Um, every other um, aspect is... Uh, at the moment, uh, not modelable as far as, as we know. So obviously the hype, uh, you know, and, and the question is also, does it make sense to model hype, right? You, like we want to get to a value that, you know, would work in a fair market and then maybe adjust it from there um, to get to an opportunity or so, but uh, still uh, understand really the quote unquote true value of the company. Um, so yeah, so that's why we study fair market value and, and yeah, these are strong assumptions, which that's why I think it's interesting to, to reflect on valuation from time to time, right? The, uh, so <clears throat> how do we determine fair market value, right? So as we were saying before, we look at, we look at risk and return, right? So we, we compare in this utilitarian view, we compare risk and return uh, of the company against risk and return of other investment opportunities. And uh, this is not us, like this is just everybody, as long as there isn't a better model, as long as we cannot quantify other types of uh, um, value that, that the investment provides, uh, we compare the value of risk and return. And just to clarify, return as we are talking about here is the, um, increase in in revenue in valuation uh in in the future basically and by risk we define it as the variability of that return so you know is it like this much with little variability or with a lot of variability right just in in finance terms right the relationship between these two is or should be at least relatively fixed uh, otherwise it would be arbitraged out in uh, in finance right so in order to, to try to determine this comparison, there are several methods. And that's, I think, what all valuation methods boil down to, trying to compare um, prices in terms of their risk-return ratio, right? Um, if you look at the risk-return ratio, we have, I think, like two main categories of uh, calculation of uh, prices. You have on one side methods that look at intrinsic value, so we're looking at book value uh, or cost to duplicate uh, of companies, or we do comparisons with other companies, right? And you have very, very crude comparisons, like very sort of basic, let's say, uh, multiple scorecard or checklist, and you have a little bit more refined, and, and we'll get a little bit into, into each of these ones. I don't want to drag this on too long, but uh, uh, a little bit touch upon the intuition and the pros and cons of each method. Uh, a bit more refined comparisons are DCFs, VC method, real option uh, methods. So in all of these ones, we're trying to see, okay, this company is different, but it's still a little bit like that canvas, right? That canvas is different, but 
we're, we're still having a size of that canvas. We have an, uh, I don't know, an amount of paint, uh, a number of, uh, a weight of paint that has been spent, the uh, cost of the colors, right? Um, and, uh, and we're trying to compare those across companies, right? So obviously you can see the cost of the colors and the canvas, right? As a cost to duplicate that painting, but, but obviously, and that's kind of one of the criticisms, right? Of the cost to duplicate uh, method, but, uh, but that's what they're trying to do, right? But if we look at uh, uh, the future instead, we look at all investments um, across the board. So this could be, you know, your, uh, your stocks and your uh, bonds and your stock market and, and funds and things, um, they all have a risk return ratio. And like we're trying to understand, given a certain return that we think this startup can do and a certain risk uh, compared to the other uh, uh, products, what is the actual price for this, uh, for this startup, right? So... Uh, so let's just uh, like see, you know, a little bit the the methods, right? I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the with multiples, right? And and uh, the multiples method, let's call it like that. But just like valuation uh, as a multiple times uh, an underlying metric, this can be EBDA, revenue, number of users, uh, number of square hectares of terrain that is. Um, uh, where we can grow crops for for an agricultural business, um, number of employees, like you, you know, a lot of metrics are used for this method, and the multiple itself is generally calculated as the average or median of multiples of similar companies, right? Um, so the pros of this are that it's super quick and super easy. Um, well relatively, you still have to find the, the comparable companies, um, which is one of the cons. It's difficult to find reliable data, especially at startup level, uh, especially when we consider, what do we consider as a similar company? So, you know, we, we, ideally we would find companies that are, that have the same level of return and risk, right? So it means that they are at the same stage, with the same knowledge, with the same uh, current revenue, with the same investment, uh, you know, the same future potential, um, quite tough to find enough data. And of course, you all companies are different. So generally, you want to find at least five, right? Five to 10 uh, similar companies that you want to uh, take a multiple out of, right? And... Um, so very difficult to find similar companies at early stage. Um, and, uh, you know, another big con is, especially at early stage, this is very, very simplistic, right? This assumes that, um, let's say, let's take a, a revenue multiple, right? This assumes that um, all other companies are going to grow the same way uh, as this company is going to grow and they have the same risk. And, they've, and also it assumes that they've been priced correctly, right? Which is a huge assumption uh, and and it's actually what drags uh, a lot of bubbles right we we price things based on on other things and and slowly things creep up and then at some point the bubble bursts but uh, yeah so you know difficult uh, difficult uh, method for sure the uh, scorecard method um it's a yeah it's an early stage a bit more refined comparison right uh, i don't know how many are aware of this method but we're basically deciding a number of criteria that we want a base valuation on. Um, we give them a weight and we give a score uh, to the startup in each of these criteria. And then we multiply the average, uh, we multiply what we get out of it for the average valuation of similar companies. So in uh, simple, simpler terms, this is just trying to understand whether this company is better or worse than the average. Uh, startup again what is an average startup right uh, at that stage and uh, if it's better it should it deserves a valuation that is higher if it's um, if it's worse then it deserves a valuation that is lower um, nothing bad is just you know maybe it hasn't gotten there yet um, pros of the scorecard it, it allows us to do a, a detailed qualitative analysis of the company um, and it allows us to, to very clearly uh, talk about investor preferences by 
deciding these weights, right? And and this is something that I think could be very useful uh, basing the weights on uh, one's experience, uh, you know, of what is important in a company for its future success. Uh, cons, it has little uh, financial element, uh, generally. Financials are not a very important part of this. Um, and yeah, it's again, it's difficult to find comparable data. Uh, as, as always, that's, uh, that's kind of the early stage uh, crux, let's say. <laughs> but um, uh, checklist, uh, similar idea. In this case, we start with a, a valuation that we think is the maximum for a startup in this stage. And then we try to understand, okay, out of this ideal startup that gets the maximum valuation, um, what percentage has this startup um, gathered? How much does it deserve of that maximum uh, so far? You know, so is the team the the best team ever? Then it deserves full points. Is the idea uh, super engaging and, and amazing? And I really believe in it. It deserves full point. And you know, on the other hand, like the product rollout uh, has been a disaster, right? It deserves zero points on that. Um, again, an, uh, pros here. We we have a detailed qualitative analysis of the company. Uh, we again can express investor preferences uh, fairly easy, easily. Um, cons, it doesn't have a lot of financial element and difficult to compare data. So these two methods are quite similar. Uh, on the side of financials, right, we have the DCFs. There are there are several on on equity, and we use two different ones. Um, but yeah, DCF methods are used for everything, right? From valuation of oil rigs to uh, management decisions uh, to valuation of stocks, obviously. Um, so, you know, what we uh, what we use it for is uh, mostly for startups that are a little bit uh, further on, where their financials uh, are a little bit uh, more reliable, right? But uh, the pros is that it allows us to do a detailed financial analysis, right? And another pro is that it, it puts returns in a broader context because what we do when we are trying to understand the discount rate of a startup or an illiquidity discount or so, we're basically comparing the startup with um, other investments, right? The industry, uh, stocks and the stock market, risk-free uh, investments, like you see all the assumptions, right, of, uh, of a capital asset pricing model it's supposed to value every type of asset as long as there is a risk and return. Um, obviously, limitations, right? There is there is a little quantitative analysis, a qualitative analysis, and um, it is sensitive to discount assumptions. If you've, I'm sure you've done DCFs um, in the past, if you have, especially when you have, you know, five or more years, you change the discount rate by 1%, the valuation could double. So uh, it is quite sensitive to this type of assumptions. Again, no, no method is perfect, right? Um, we have the VC method. I'm sure everybody aware of this one as well. Um, very simple. This is how we, we show it in our report. Um, but we multiply uh, the BTA for a multiple in order we understand however way uh, an estimate of, uh, of an exit value uh, in whatever time horizon you have for, for this company, for your investment, right? We assume an ROI. So we want to have a certain return for uh, for this investment. This is generally based on the risk of this investment, right? So let's say a VC wants to have uh, every investment return 10x in 10 years, let's say, broadly speaking. Um, and then with this return, we can calculate a, uh, a post-money valuation in this case, uh, and then minus capital needed, it's a pre-money valuation. So, um, the beauty of this is that it can be, uh, the, the math can be done in your head pretty much uh, instantaneously. Uh, once you know your multiplier, your ideal multiplier for a certain level of risk. Um, uh, and I think another good point is that it keeps the perspective on the end goal. A lot of these methods like, like DCF, it has a lot of focus on each year and profitability and things like that, which are yes, important, but you know, for a lot of startups, the, the, the important thing is that end game. Are we going to actually be able to reach the end game or not? And what's the probability of reaching that end game, right? So uh, cons of the VC method, um, it has little qualitative analysis, very, very uh, sensitive to discount assumptions, especially 
uh, when we stretch this into 10 years uh, horizons and things like that. Um, and sometimes it's very like simplistic and not precise in the sense that, okay, it's going to tell me that the valuation is between five and 10 millions, but you know, like what if the proposal is 7.5, is that high or not? You know, uh, the, the VC method is, is generally not uh, the best uh, way to understand that. We have real options, right? So <laughs> this is uh, when, when math takes the lead because um, I really believe this was made, well, it was made for the stock market, right? And for the valuation of, uh, of options um, with Black and & Scholes and, and things like that. Um, and people tried to apply it in startups. Um, it basically works, uh, which is a very good intuition to, it tries to model the startup as a series of options uh, of what the startup can do. And each option has a probability, has a return, has a variance. And then through uh, basically math, we get to calculate what's the value of all those options today. Because the startup is basically... Uh, put it simply, the sum of the value of the futures that it can have, right? Uh, which is a very fascinating idea, uh, which like, you know, we, we would love to implement, I think, but uh, it's just, uh, we find it too, um, too mathy, too complicated for, uh, you know, it doesn't expand our human understanding of the startup. It may be expanding the mathematical understanding, but when we need to set a probability and a variance of each uh, option, like it gets very complicated very fast and it doesn't add much information. Um, another sort of uh, belief of mine is that a lot of uh, startups already have all their options in their normal financial projections. <laughs> you know, they try to they try to uh, fit in everything in their projections, right? So. Um, yeah, so then this option uh, method doesn't really add uh, a whole lot, but that's just me. Um, book value and cost to duplicate, uh, not going to spend too much time on them. Um, one is the book value, right? So the value uh, in the balance sheet and the cost to duplicate is how much it would cost to duplicate the same product. Uh, they can be useful. They, they definitely give a useful baseline, especially in circumstances when the team will not continue. We really need to value the assets. And on the other hand, where the assets of the company are the main value, like, you know, real estate, uh, I don't know if you're valuing a crypto portfolio or something. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and they have the, the pro of investigating the past of the company, arguably, you know, uh, a pro, especially in, in, in startups, right? But um, for startups, the cons are that they are backward looking. Um, Accounting rules make, uh, especially book value, uh, a low bound. Right, it's the lowest, almost the lowest value that you can that you can give to the company. Um, almost right. So there are there are lower values in case things are not going well. Um, digital, uh, yeah. The other thing is that digital businesses create a lot of intangibles uh, that are not measured uh, or measurable. And, and that's the idea of that canvas, right? If we, if we look at the book value of buying the paint and buying the canvas, um, how much of the value of the painting are we actually capturing, you know? Uh, and some, you know, a lot of digital businesses are like that. And also it's also a little bit aided by the, finance, by the accounting system itself that a lot of times doesn't consider uh, investments, things that are actually investments and they just get put uh, as a cost, and then they are um, they they are not reflected in the balance sheet, right? Um, and then, uh, yeah, the other thing is that they just a lot of times they are just a very very low estimate, especially for digital businesses. You know, a lot of founders that we speak with, uh, they they have as assets only their laptops, or they think they their only asset is their laptop. Um, but every other asset, the value of their brand, the value of what they created. Um, is not captured in this method. If you want to capture it as an asset, you basically need to do a DCF. So it doesn't have a lot of uh, advantages. Uh, so yeah, so for us, uh, we we don't believe in book value and cost to duplicate as you have guessed probably um, for startups and also real options uh, <clears throat> are not are not for us. Um, having said that, we use five methods, but, but in general, why 
should you use more than one method is uh, because as you saw, each of them has a different point of view and also different biases, right? And and they look at different things and they have a different take on this comparison of risk and, and returns and, and no method is, is perfect, right? Um, what we saw that is kind of interesting in what we do is that we we use the qualitative methods as a baseline. So we com when, when we compare startups with other startups, that could always be a baseline in case the startup changes track completely. And that happens obviously a lot. Um, the VC method, we find that is relatively stable in the middle of, uh, of uh, the methods. And, uh, and DCF really allows us to take into account the specifics of a plan, which the earlier the startup, the more the plan can change, obviously, and the more the projections are going to be about the old plan, right? But um, but we see that this combination uh, for us allows us to take into account the baseline, quote unquote, assets of the startups um, and, and also their potential, their future potential <coughs> of the plan. Sorry. So... It looks like a lot of work, right? Is it is it uh, worth it to do all this effort uh, for an uncertain valuation, right? Um, yes and no. So the, the alternative, right, is to take the given price, right, uh, the the market price, uh, without reflecting on on whether it's correct or not, which you know can be can be a strategy. So I think though against the alternative, right, the the, the first point is that. Um, I believe startup prices were not correct for a long time. Uh, in the last 15, 20 years, I think startups were undervalued, um, especially SaaS uh, was not, I think was not understood in terms of risk, uh, obviously, because it was not proven or anything, but uh, now it is. Uh, now valuations are, are higher uh, and risks are more understood. Um, so, is it is it are they still like the question i think now when calculating valuation is are startups still worth it at these valuations right do i am, am i gonna make the returns that i want for 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 my money uh and for the risk that i'm taking and uh, are all of them you know worth this uh risk right so um and the other question that I, that i'm kind of pondering more and more is like now that the game is understood uh, do startups still have the opportunity of being winner take all services, right? So, uh, like ten years ago when we started, um, that was the idea, kind of for for every startup with the big impact of network effects, and then it was data network effects, and um, and nowadays, like you see, you know, there was capital network effects with the case of Uber and like companies raising so much capital and just deploying it incredibly fast. Um, that kind of didn't pan out, uh, or at least the way they, they wanted, um, or the way it was thought it would. And, uh, you know, is it uh, still the case that all the startups can be worldwide winners? You know, that's, that's kind of a question. Uh, Second, obviously, the more mature the startup, the more it becomes worth it to investigate valuation, right? This is kind of clear. That's why accelerators don't do much uh, valuation. They just give a straight up standard offer. Uh, but then when you get to, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs uh, for your IPO, they do a proper valuation, right? So um, it's uh, obviously when the startup becomes more mature, uh, it is more uh, interesting and useful to do to do a more deep valuation. Um, the other question is like you know if you use tools, the cost of doing it decreases, so maybe it becomes more uh, worth doing it, right? So in the end, though, the, the the main point is that it's a spectrum, right? The question of like is valuation worth doing is a spectrum question. Like you can go all the way from take the given price right, to the other end of the spectrum, conduct an all-out valuation exercise. And like, yeah, you, like you're not escaping. It's just a question of like, how much do you want to, do you want to uh, invest in terms of time um, and in terms of effort on understanding the, the valuation of the company? Um, obviously, this should be deal by deal. Um, 
according to the risk of the deal, the stage of the company, experience of the investor, personal preference. You know, some some people have a strong preference towards doing versus not doing it. Uh, the amounts involved as well, right? If it's small transactions, it doesn't make sense to spend a lot of time on them, uh, you know. But uh, um, the interesting thing, right, of this spectrum is that it's basically uh, the same of... Uh, taking a broad average or a very specific average, right? As we said before, the prices are comparisons, right? Uh, with, with other uh, investment opportunities. So uh, the simple taking the price of the market just means taking a broad or convenient or easy to find average. Uh, whereas on the other side, a very specific valuation means researching and understanding a very specific average, right? So. That's kind of the 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 funny thing for uh, for me. Um, that's that's you know <laughs> what I find funny in the, in what I do. But uh, the um, valuation then becomes the art of averages, right? So how do I get a very specific average in little time? Uh, and and key to this is without including too much noise, right? So as we think about the the realm of possibilities of comparisons, we look at Every method looks at similar looks at similar companies one way or another, right? So DCFs for all the discounts, um, uh, checklist for for finding the average startup valuation, right? So every method looks at averages in in uh, one shape or form. The question is, what do we include and, and how do we do these averages? And this kind of brings us to I think what is the the art of valuation, which is kind of the the art of averages, right? So we can pick as wide. Uh, we can throw as wide a net as we want to, but there are trade-offs, right? And um, the trade-offs are uh, are this ones, and then like this kind of the last um, topic for for today. Um, but if I narrow the comparison, right? So if I try to go more specific in the averages that I uh, that I pick, and we're saying averages, right? It could be uh, it could be median, like whatever mathematical comparison you want to do, <coughs> and works the best for you. Uh, so if I narrow that down, if I try to look for more specific comparables, uh, I get more similar results, which in theory get me a more accurate quote unquote valuation, right? Um, a more close to the market valuation, right? Uh, and then market could be widely wrong, but you know. Um, so if I do that, right, uh, I have, uh, I mean, obviously I spend more time in finding these results because they are more specific. Um, and then the other the other uh, things though that are interesting is that I'm introducing noise. I'm introducing noise in two ways, right? One is I'm making assumptions on what is actually similar, and that's kind of you know uh, sure like uh, most of the times uh, they are good assumptions, but um, you know who knows? And and like for example, for a long time uh, biotech was um, uh, not understood. Right in terms of economics and and investment opportunities, because people were making assumptions and they were trying to judge these startups as tech startups, and they were not tech startups. And at that point, again, in my opinion, uh, tech startups were were undervalued, and uh, biotech companies were not getting investments at all because you know they were not understood. Um, as I narrow down the comparison and I uh, sort of find less data, I'm also increasing the variability in the average. Obviously, <clears throat> if I do an average of uh, three companies, the variability is going to be uh, very high according to which three companies I choose, right? If I'm doing an average of 100 companies, uh, the variability is going to be less, um, right? So that's, uh, that's another factor that induces noise. The opposite, on the other hand, right, is also, uh, so as I expand the comparison, I look for, for uh, you know, I, I, I use more companies for the same average, quote unquote. Um, what do I get? I get as a negative, I get less similar results, obviously, because um, I'm comparing the company with progressively more different companies in theory, right? Um, 
I'm making my life a little bit easier on the pro side uh, to uh, find data because I'm, I'm being less strict with my criteria. Uh, and I'm introducing less noise. Uh, so I'm making actually less assumptions on what actually is similar. And I'm including less variability in the average as well, because you know I don't have to be as quote unquote good at finding uh, the right similar companies. So yeah, so that's that's not an easy that's not an easy task, right? But that's really that's really I think what what uh, reevaluation is about. Aside from the methods and the things that are relatively understood, this is where where the art comes in and uh, and uh, the experience and the difference between person to person um, comes in and and can make the difference, right? So, uh, of course. Uh, how do we pick the right average, right? And uh, this is a bit of a, uh, a, a, a of, of, of a joke. is very is very difficult. Um, but we're we're gonna talk about it more in the next uh, in the next webinar. Um, <clears throat> no, there is no golden rule to pick the right average. It's just a lot of experience um, and uh, and and judgment, right? And case by case judgment. But uh, but if you wanna join us uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, in two weeks exactly, we'll do another one. On valuation, and this time is going to be about practice, uh, how to calculate valuation efficiently. Um, you know what the valuations say about the startup, uh, which is also a very interesting point, I think, and uh, portfolio valuation and and how to do that. So uh, that's going to be a more practical session in uh, two weeks together with Dilum again. Um, but yeah, for now, uh, I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'm going to switch to the Q and A that I saw. We have uh, we have a few so. I hope this was valuable for you and uh, we have, uh, yeah, feel free to add me on LinkedIn anytime uh, or to email us at uh, info at uh, for anything. We move to the, to the questions. <coughs> Give me a second, I get a bit of water. Hmm. Right, uh, so Fernando, uh, hi Fernando, says, what are the best free resources of comparable companies? And he's mentioning DRUM, Crunchbase, CB Insight, Oler, the Modern. And yeah, you mentioned them all. <laughs> um, I like uh, 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 for, for Asian companies, there is a, a company called Venture Cap Insights. Um, and uh, otherwise, I think you've, you're, you've mentioned uh, pretty much all of them. Um, yeah, and also if you look at paid uh, alternatives, um, you are getting the same information. There is a bit more information on the Chamber of Commerce, maybe um, Moody's uh, with the Bureau Van Dijk has a bunch of information from the Chamber of Commerce, but that's of limited usage. It's all quite old, like a couple of years old generally. So yeah. Not easy. Uh, crowdfunding platforms are also an interesting source, you know, despite the fact that they might be very, very biased. Uh, they have information in the clear and, and it's recent information and you can uh, go very deep in the startups uh, themselves because the, the pitch is online. So maybe that is something, yeah. Uh, how to compare similar companies uh, uh, targeting the same market, but based in different country place? Yeah, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. And, and are differences in valuation justified just because of geography differences, right? Um, that's a great question. The, uh, yeah, so the way that we cope with it is that there are country variables in the calculation, especially of DCF, uh, but also of, of checklist and, uh, well, checklist and scorecard, they compare with similar companies in the, um, in the same area. Yeah, so you're asking about targeting the same market. Yeah, that's a good question. So we always get asked like, is the target ma market that matters or is it where the company is based or is it where the company is gonna raise capital, right? So I think more and more we're going into a direction where capital is global, but markets are not, even though markets are also fairly global. Um, generally, I advise to do a, a balance of the three, you know, um, if the whole team is based in, in Germany and the market is the US and the funding is going to come from the UK, 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We generally uh, advise to uh, yeah, kind of pick the the main concern there and and what they're also gonna defend because if they raise if they want to raise at U.S. valuations, they need to they need to defend the fact that they are uh, they have the same risk return of a U.S. company, which might be true, uh, but might be not true. So there is also a component of what's defensible. Yeah. Uh, oh, I can click answer live. Okay. Um, so done. Then uh, we have, yeah, we have one uh, from PA. What kind of valuation method is generally adopted by Shark Tank contestants and judges? Do you feel the approach chosen uh, is right as seven uh, out of 10 Shark Tank failed? Uh, that's a good question. So I was always thinking like, uh, so I saw the Shark Tank in the Netherlands had 700 applications, uh, 750, and they accepted about 100, I think, and they invested in, yeah, 20 or 30, as you, as you said. So I think like what people forget is that Shark Tank is competitive uh, show. So if like, they're not going to invest in every, no investor is going to invest in every opportunity. They're going to invest in the best opportunities, right? And it seems like they settle on, you know, like three out of 10 or something like that. It's, uh, it's, it's quite funny to see. So <laughs> I'm not surprised that seven out of 10 don't get investments. A few of them are also just there uh, to entertain. Um, and, and the producers already know that they're not going to get investment. But still, investors are only going to invest in the, in the top ones. Yeah, so if the level rises, we're still, I think, going to get um, seven out of 10 uh, fails, you know? Um, the methods that they use, I think they're fairly, at least, uh, well, I haven't watched it in a long time, to be honest, but, uh, but uh, back in the days, it was fairly simple, um, like almost like uh, multiple methods. Like they were asking a few questions like, hey, do you, what kind of revenue do you have? Especially to the bigger, to the bigger companies, the ones that were a little bit more established, they were asking uh, these type of things, and then uh, to the earlier ones, uh, they were just using averages and a bit adapting the averages. So these methods, like you know, it's basically the same methods. They were not as used as formally, I think, but uh, but mostly that's that's what they do. Yeah, and then. Obviously, there is a lot of negotiation power there, right? The 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 show is structured to give a lot of uh, power to these investors, uh, and at the same time, to give a lot of power of uh, uh, yeah of of negotiation to to these investors, right? So. Uh, I think a lot of times that they also they are big investors, right? They have a brand, they have uh, other value that they bring on top of money, so they're kind of almost forced to invest money for the program. But you know, an endorsement or a collaboration with one of their companies uh, would already be worth a lot. So that is not accounted for in the valuation uh, itself on on the show <coughs> most of the times. Uh, right. Uh, where do you get financial stats for private early stage companies? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we have some material published. If you look for average um, forecasted growth rate for startups, um, and we're gonna do a lot more spoiler in a couple of months, but um, yeah, it's very difficult to find uh, that information. Yeah. Um, crowdfunding platforms, you know, maybe somebody has aggregated a few of those um, things, but uh, very, very hard to find. Yeah. Uh, how do you use the ROI to get to 4.6 million from 15 million exit value? That's a good question. Uh, da, 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 was it 15 million? I think. Uh, yeah, so, so what we do here is that we have reverse calculated um, required returns for investors at a certain uh, stage of development of the company, right? So let's say, um, I don't know, startup stage or depending, like um, we look at a portfolio, right? We say, okay, a VC portfolio returns 20% per year. Out of that portfolio, two companies are the ones that need to bring 
you know, 80% of the return. And if you do that calculation, you kind of understand that uh, a priori. So before, right, the every company needs to look like one of those companies, right? So they need to look like they can have that return. So that return is, let's say for this VC, 10x per year on a period of 10 years, right? And that is roughly speaking, I, I don't know the math now, but but you know, if you calculate that, you get to, uh, in, in some of the cases, you get to 48.6% per year, right? So what we're doing here is the opposite, um, is the opposite mathematical operation of a compounded growth. So if 4.6 million grows at 48% per year for three years, it becomes 15 million, right? And so we just do the opposite and we start from the, endpoint and we just get to the current valuation uh i hope i hope that is clear um but uh, yeah that's that's how it works we also do have a methodology uh, our methodology uh, paper on the website so if you just look for equity methodology on google um and there is a, a lot more about uh, how to do this um What's the Equidam revenue model? Uh, we are a uh, paper use pretty much. So for, for startups, 90% of what we do is sell side. So it's the startups themselves. And uh, you know the, the outcome of the Equidam process is a report. Um, startups basically pay per access. Uh, and then as long as they have access, they can download reports. And um, the buy side, so we serve uh, advisors, uh, accountants, um, uh, investors, corporate venture capital, venture capital, everything. Uh, we have a, a license, which is basically just a, a volume discount pretty much for people that need to have larger volumes. Yeah. And uh, if you want to learn more about that, I think Julio from our side is in, yeah, <laughs> is in the meeting as well. If you go on our homepage, there is a, a button to book a demo for the platform. And, you know, you, you just get a call with Julio and he has all the information about those things. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So, so yeah. sorry, sorry, Daniel, uh, just yeah. one more from the chat. Uh, it was a comment. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the question is, is how do uh, you kind of uh, correct the potential loopholes where startups yeah. uh, try to push up yeah. their valuations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, from uh, from another, yeah, I see it. Thank you for the question. Yeah, we <laughs> we combat that with transparency, right? So we we believe that as long as investors and uh, entrepreneurs agree agree on the future and agree on the risk uh, that there is. Um, they should come down to the same valuation, right? And so what we try to do is we try to make those assumptions as transparent as possible in our in our report, which I don't have here. Like this is a, a bit of a screenshot and uh, this is a bit, no, this is from our methodology. So yeah, so we try to make all the, the, all the assumptions very visible so that if something is not believable, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna be caught, you know? Because a lot of the, Valuation calculations, they kind of hide a lot of complexity in either text or, or math or something like that. And, and we try to do the opposite to prevent that problem. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Uh, Sandeep, one last question. Awesome. Uh, is there a rule of thumb that uh, can sometimes be applied to these companies that are growing over 50% with certain margin structure like gross margin? Uh, yes, right. Like to be, to be honest, there, there are like, you can apply multiples, right? That's, that's what they're for. The question for me is, um, are they useful? Right. And, and, and what, like how useful are they, you know? And the, the analogy that I always do is that you have those magazines that tell you the average value of a Volkswagen Golf, right. From 10 years ago. And, um, and like when you actually go and you look at it, it's on fire, right? So you're not gonna pay the the value that is written in the magazine for the car on fire, right? So that's kind of the the value that those super simple types of rule of thumbs have. Um, 
they tell you a starting point, but I think they are not, uh, you know, specific enough to be of actual value. And and this works both ways. Also for for entrepreneurs, I know like a lot of uh, a lot of entrepreneurs that you know um, absolutely don't want to sell the company under a certain multiple, you know, because they saw that. Uh, public companies are at that multiple right now, and or or, or something, or a friend of theirs uh, sold at that multiple. Yeah, uh, it, it kind of uh, in Italian we say it, it leaves the the weather that it finds. You know, it doesn't really make a big a big change in uh, knowing that. Yeah, but yeah, that's how. Excellent. Uh, awesome. Thank you very much, Daniel, uh, for all the insights. Uh, yeah, from our side as well, please do join the, the next webinar uh, in two weeks on the same topic. We also have on next Wednesday a webinar on the angel investing future, where we have a panelists from the North America as well as Europe talking about what will be happening, what is happening, what are the trends and what will be happening in, in five to ten years. A very exciting session coming up as well uh, next Wednesday, slightly earlier uh, at uh, 3 p.m. UTC. Um, and for those who uh, didn't notice uh, the chat questions and answers, then the recording of the webinar uh, and any follow-up materials and information will be posted on our anniversary page, which is dealum.com slash dealum-5. And, and uh, you can find them uh, after the event uh, on the next day. But uh, awesome. for today, wrapping up. Thank you to everyone who joined. Thank you, Daniel. And Thanks, I hope Seren. to see everyone soon. Same, same. Have a good <laughs> anniversary. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.